Gospel for Canada Community Church on this Lord's Day, first Lord's Day of 2021, January 3rd, as we're about to uh, continue our, our, our series on the topic of discipleship. So let us pray. Father, we thank you that you did call us to become disciples, and we all have a different idea what a discipleship of Jesus Christ is looks like from our own learning and our own experience and our own background. Father, I pray as we look into your scripture tonight, as we look into the matter of the consecration of the disciple, that we would gain some understanding on how we as Christians can be more molded to the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ through our own participation and cooperation with the Holy Spirit. This I pray in Jesus' name. So, for those of you who have an outline, you're welcome to follow along. We'll be going through the scriptures from there. For those of you following on YouTube, we're mainly in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 6 and chapters 11. But we will be moving around a little bit, but if you're looking for a good place to anchor yourself in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 6, and 11. So the first thing I'd like to try to do briefly is give a definition to consecration. In my studies, I wanted to know myself because most of the time when we think about becoming more holy as Christians, we think of the work of the Holy Spirit called sanctification. And that's the Spirit's work in the life of the believer, to conform them and mold them to the likeness of Christ. So a definition of consecration in an active sense, as I'm a participant or a, a willing, submissive vessel, is, what is consecration? Answer, a separation of oneself from things that are unclean and would contaminate our relationship with God. So what is consecration? Consecration is separating oneself from the things that are unclean and would contaminate our relationship with God. First thing I want to make clear is we're not dealing with the, the uh, Levitical restrictions of, of dietary law here, for example. We're, we're dealing with spiritual realities, not necessarily bodily um, food ingestion. Jesus made clear, for example... All foods are made clean, clear, and by prayer they're sanctified if, if when, when eaten with thanksgiving. So this is not a sermon about dietary laws. Another way to understand consecration is this. It is the human side of our sanctification process, which is primarily the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So consecration is the human side or responsibility in the sanctification process, which is primarily the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So in order to make clear that we start off on the right track as to what consecration is and is not, we have to first understand that consecration is a byproduct of justification or sanctification, which is the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who makes us a new person. We're not merely talking about a moral reform here or teaching morality. There was a, a, a preacher that I heard that said, if you try to, to teach unregenerate people morality, it's essentially a dead rose project. So you take a rose that is a living thing, it's beautiful, you cut it at the stem, it may look pretty and beautiful for a time, but because it's been cut off, it's dead, and eventually it will wither away. So we're not talking about giving morality lessons to un unregenerate people. Another uh, maybe crass way of saying this, I've heard once saying, if you put lipstick on a pig, for example, it, the pig won't be beautiful because it, it's still a pig just wearing lipstick. So the idea here is, the first point that I'd like to make is the seal of the consecrated. So in the sense of, of the, the, the protocol or 
the order of things, the seal of, of, of the consecration must happen beforehand. In the sense that we don't put the ox before the cart, or rather we don't put the cart before the ox, but we put the ox before the cart. So one must have the Holy Spirit, in first of all, in order to be a participant in the consecration process. So for that, we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Pardon me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And here Paul is sharing in the, the fellowship with these, these born-again Christians and reminding them of their position in Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit. So I'm here reading, verse 21 says... Is 2 Corinthians 1, 21? 2 Corinthians 1, starting from 21. I'm reading from the New King James. The New Testament. Yeah, he says, <laughs> Now he who established us is with you in Christ and has anointed us in God. That is to say... When a person is born again, they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, and the word anointing here is a general covering. We've been baptized by Him. We are now immersed in the person of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And He has established us. So in fact, He has rooted us. He has given us a, a right standing by which we can continue on in this work of righteousness. We have been set apart by the Holy Spirit, that is sanctification, and it is the foundation of consecration. As we read, verse 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And this is one of the greatest verses for making a case for the, the eternal security of the believer, the sealing by which the Holy Spirit acts as a guarantee or a pledge of our further glory or our full redemption. A, a, a good case and point that a true believer cannot lose their salvation because in order to lose their salvation, the Holy Spirit's seal would ha somehow have to be broken or ha somehow have to be removed. And it would have to be someone or something mightier than God to break that seal. And we know from studying Bible that there is no one beside or above the Lord God. Amen. So, amen. He is our guarantee. And so this is the establishment or the starting point of what, how we can uh, start in consecration. We have to have the seal of the consecrated. We have to have the Holy Spirit. And from that point now, as a human being... We're given a responsibility. Now that we've covered the election and the sealing, now we cover the human responsibility or the consecration of the individual. And we see how that works out or unfolds on a practical level for each and every disciple of Jesus Christ. So for the sake of those of us who remember, we started all the lessons with C. We said it was the call of the disciple, the commissioning of the disciple, the characteristic of the disciple, this one is called the consecration of the disciple, which is the human responsibility of how we can be disciples of Jesus Christ. So the first principle that we would like to explore to help us in our walk as a disciple is what we're calling the separation of the consecrated disciple. The separation of the consecrated disciple and for that, we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. So first we will cover what this verse means, and then we'll also on the tail end of it cover what it doesn't mean, because this is a verse that's often taken out of proper context and applied falsely. So in verse 14 it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? 
Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? So in these verses, we have stark contrast between a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and an unregenerate person or someone who's not yet in the faith. And the question that the Apostle Paul asks us as a foundation for his command is, what common ground can we find if we have different allegiances or a different power base or a different master that we serve? A good example in our modern world or any type of um, antiquity would be in a war time, a soldier who's fighting in opposing nations, they would not be allies because their commanding officers would want them to stay loyal to the, their national side. So, for example, if one country is fighting another country, we wouldn't say, well, they're, they're somehow going to be a truce between them. If the war is, is on, then there, there has to be um, loyalty or, or um, no, no truce between the two sides. And that's what essentially what Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying that the church is distinct from the rest of the world. Because according to, according to Scripture, the world, the Bible says, lies under the lap of the evil one or is under the control of the enemy of God, which is the fallen angel, Satan. And those who are born again are under the lordship of the, 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 the king of the church, who is Jesus Christ, who is the enemy of Satan, and Satan is the enemy of Jesus in verse 18, he says, or pardon me, in verse 17 of that same chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, or I don't want to miss it here. Therefore, he says, I want to go back to 16. For you are the temple of the living God. The fact is, we belong to Christ, and we are grafted into his body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We become partakers of the divine divine nature. We are sealed by the Spirit. We read in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, 22. Therefore, we have an allegiance now to the new kingdom, that is to say, the kingdom of God, by, the, by virtue of being sealed by the Spirit. He says... For you are the temple of the living God. That is to say, we are ambassadors of God on earth. Because God is in heaven, but the church is upon the earth. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We know in Jeremiah chapter 33, there was prophesied a time when... God would make a new covenant with his people and he would write it in their hearts. And that's a, 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 that covenant is partially fulfilled through the church age. It will be completely fulfilled when the nation of Israel is, is grafted in as well. But for now, we are benefactors of that covenant. We are the temple of God. When Jesus, for example, went to the cross, he said was finished the temple was, the veil of the temple was torn. That was no longer the way to God. Now he became the way to God. And so us, the church, we are now the living stones that are being built upon the cornerstone, who is Christ Jesus. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So in light of our being built in this spiritual temple, which is the body of Christ, in light of us being separated from the kingdom of darkness and bring, brought into the kingdom of light, in light of us being allied with Christ Jesus the Lord and an enemy of Satan, therefore, verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So that brings us the principle of separation, that a Christian is not to... Is not to marry into the things of the, the world or the things that aren't of Christ. And the principal areas of union, as we know as, as human institutions, is marriage. 
marriage is the primary example of, a, of an institution where a Christian believer is not to marry an unbelieving spouse. That is, that is principal teaching, not to be unequally yoked. Another area where the church should not collaborate in a partnership with those who are unsaved or unregenerate is in spiritual enterprise, in spiritual enterprise. Because there can be no collaboration between God's church and the kingdom of darkness. So this principle extends further in our choice of friends. If we have friends that we are having partnership with, in, for example, our leisure or entertainment, we must remember that if we league ourselves or yoke ourselves and give all of ourselves to that relationship, we will then reap the, the consequence of being unequally yoked and we will be influenced by it. Now, at the onset of this, I would say that there are misunderstandings about this passage and we will get to that shortly. To make this point more clear to us, looking at the Old Testament, we will look at the separation in the book of, of Leviticus, in Leviticus 19.19, 19, from the Mosaic Law, to understand In Leviticus, we're giving, given regulations to govern the nation of Israel to make them a distinct people so that they would not fall prey to idolatrous customs and also so that they, could, they would keep social order. In Leviticus 19.19, 19, there's an example of separation here that makes us, helps us understand this idea of being yoked. It says... You shall keep my statutes, statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. But the verse that, that we want to, to camp on here is that you shall not lot, let your livestock breed with another kind. So the same oxen who would pull that cart, they would have to be the same species so that they could walk in unison. The idea here is that of a agricultural beast of burden pulling a, a plow in a farmer field. And if unless the animals are the same type, one will maybe pull ahead and the other will stray behind. So the idea here is that as a Christian, if you want to walk in a, in a, in a way without falling, you need to have one beside you who's pulling in the same way you're pulling. So the principle of being equally yoked means comes from this principle of having similar animals working in a similar task. Just like, for example, in in uh, horse racing, we, we, we wouldn't have ponies racing with horses and donkeys. It just wouldn't be a fair race. The the taller animals would win, and the, the little donkeys would, would lose the race. So in the same way as Christians were to run the race with others in our in our midst that are like-minded, Christ, Christ followers. So in order to stop some possible confusion about what this verse is not saying, I would like for us to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 and 10. What does that have to do with darkness? The garment with two different materials. It's to, it, it's related in the sense that it, it lays per, it, it just lay, helps us understand the principle of separation. But let's go to First Corinthians ch that, that, chapter five. It doesn't make a good point at all. <laughs> I think it does. Okay. With garments of two different of two different materials. You're in your sin burden, or it's relief for you. You're seeing, you don't see. Well, no, it, it just strengthens the material. That it's with two different materials. Well, I can't, I can't speak as an authority in the mixing fabrics, but I know when Jesus spoke to his disciples, when he used the same analogy of the, the yoke, he said, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. 
So he says, if you want to walk correctly in this world, you got to walk next to me. Yeah. And we know Christ as our perfect example. He was he was a, obviously full of the Holy Spirit. So we should also walk with others who are of the Holy Spirit too. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9 tells us what this verse does not mean as so that we don't misunderstand this principle. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world or the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner or even eat with such a person. So clearly we see that this regulation is for those who claim to be Christian and are posturing as spirit-filled individuals. We do not partner in ministry with, with those who live an unsanctified or an unconsecrated lifestyle. In terms of the people of the world, we also don't make partnerships with them in the sense that we are not equally yoked, but we still have to rub shoulders with unsafe people. For example, if you have to go see a physician and your physician is an unbeliever, and we, you know, for example, they're living in a sinful lifestyle, you don't, you don't reject that physician because of his sinful lifestyle. You go see him recognizing that he is not a believer, but you are, you are, you are still rubbing shoulders with him. He's in the world, but you're not partaking in that same sin in which that physician does. Another example is if you go to the, to the, the baker to buy bread, you don't not shop at the baker's shop who's a, diff, a different faith of you in the sense that you're thinking that you're keeping yourself uh, pure from that from the influence of that baker on the other hand you wouldn't make that baker your prayer partner and and you become a uh, yoke to that person or for example if you would marry that baker as a as a as a spouse you would become unequally yoked to that person jesus says to be in the world, but not to be of the world, Apostle Paul is saying, do not make an, an alliance or an allegiance with those who are unequally yoked. A good example in the Bible, when things went wrong for the Israelites, when they became unequally yoked, is when they went to, for example, when Abraham went to Egypt, he got into a lot of trouble making alliances with, with the Egyptians. You remember he ended up giving his wife over to the Pharaoh there in Egypt. And you, we know also that he ended up getting a, a maidservant named, named Hagar, who later on ended up having a, a child, Abraham's child. Again, because Abraham, although he was the man of faith, he had his moments of weakness. And in weakness, we can sometimes make these unholy alliances or these unequally yoked Alliances, which usually cause harm. So that was the separation of the consecrated disciple. Next, we'll look at the defilement of sin. The defilement of sin, briefly. We'll go to Psalm 51, verse 2 and 7. So what trips us up in the entanglement of being unequally yoked is the sin that the, the unbeliever brings to our, our mind or our, it, we are tempted with. We know that when temptation comes, it's never of God. God cannot tempt anyone because God is good. God, God does not deal in temptation. Temptation is an evil thing when we provoke someone to sin. And as we'll see in Psalm 51, verse 2. My mom does that. She provokes me to sin. <laughs> in verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And verse 7 says, Purge me with hyssop 
and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So the desire here is to be to be made whole and to be to have the sins removed. Sin is a defilement and it, it ruins our our usefulness to our God because it stains our, our consecration. Instead of being separate from it, we are polluted by it. And so therefore, as Christians, we're told to go confess our sins. And then God will forgive us our sins and will we'll be given a spirit, of, again, of right standing before our God. So sin is a defilement. So how do we avoid sin as disciples of Christ now that we know we're supposed to be equally yoked and we're to walk in consecration? For that, we turn to the consecration of the mind and body of the disciple. We go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God so beyond the separation of sinful relationships we must also separate ourselves from the philosophies of the world that are against our biblical teachings in many ways we have cultural backgrounds or societal norms that have infiltrated in our own thinking, perhaps our families, and even the church. But these standards, though societally accepted, are not the standards by which the church should be governed. We are to look into the pages of Scripture and reprogram our thinking according to the written Word of God, which is the Bible. And in verse 2, we're told that our bodies, or rather in verse 1, we're told that our bodies are to be offered as a living sacrifice. So whereas before we would use our bodies and our minds for evil, now we have a stewardship to use our bodies and our minds for that which pleases God. So we have a responsibility to carry out the, 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 the consecration of our bodies. And we will see an example of this consecration in a... In a, um, in a point in the nation of Israel, and we will bring it back to Psalm 51 that talked about the washing away of the sin. So we'll go for that to, to the book of Joshua, chapter 3, verse 5, where we'll see an example of a people told to consecrate themselves. And as a historical background, Moses led the wilderness wanderings for 40 years in the desert. And Joshua was the choice of God to make the people of Israel leave the wilderness wanderings and enter the promised land, the land of Canaan, which was flowing with milk and honey. So this land, this good land, was far better than the previous way of life, which was the wilderness wanderings. But before they were able to go from the bad experience, which was the wilderness experience, to the land flowing with milk and honey, which was the promised land, God gave them instructions to consecrate themselves. So we look here in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. 
And so you have the nation of Israel crossing the Jordan River, getting wet, getting wet. Now, we know in the desert, there's not much water. Water is scarce. If you read the story, you remember that the way they got water during Moses' reign, Moses would have to tap a, a rock and water would gush out of the rock. In this instance, now, the Israelites are faced for the first time with flowing water, an abundance of water. And so this, this washing away of the, the physical dirt upon all the Israelites is a symbol of the sanctification that they would have to, to, to actualize in their hearts in order to possess this land. It was a good land, but if you remember, there was obstacles in that land. There was forests to be cleared. There were enemies to be fought. There were fortresses to capture. And there was a people there that had to be defeated. And it took great courage, great courage to go into that land, to possess it. And that's... A, an example of the people being told to consecrate themselves. And if going back to Psalm 51 briefly, this washing away is a representation of an inward cleansing or repentance. When, when the Lord says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, he's not talking about ritual hand washing. He's talking about the motivation of, between using our bodies to do evil, to extortion from others, to steal from others, to covet from others. These evil motives did not require external washing, but rather internal washing. When, when Jesus confronted the religious leaders, he says, you wash the outside of the cup, but you don't wash the inside of the cup. He was talking about inward change. He was talking about repentance. Just like, for example, he called them whitewashed tombs. Jesus called the hypocrites whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they were adorned, but on the interior, they were dead man's bones because they had not cleansed themselves. They had not had the, the washing of the interior, which we know is the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Remembering now that the first step was the seal of the consecration, which is the wa the washing away of our sins through the new birth. Let's keep going now that we've we've looked at a, a call for consecration. Let's look at it, a good example of consecration in the lives of the nation of Israel during the reign of a righteous good king. King Hezekiah was one of the good kings of Israel according to the scriptures, as we go to 2 Kings chapter 18. And I'm reading the, seven, the first seven verses by way of introduction. Second Kings chapter 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elab, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So you have one king at the north of the nation of Israel named Hoshea, and the southern king of Judah being Hezekiah, son of Ahaz. Ahaz was a wicked king who did not walk in the ways of the Lord. And he had set up all these evil entrappings and yoked the nation of Israel with all the sinful practices of the neighboring countries and nations. So now Hezekiah has a job to do. He has to consecrate the nation. He has to call forth religious reforms so that the people of Israel... Who are following pagan foreign gods will once again follow the one true God. At least as leader, he intends for this to happen. He began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was 
Abai, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. So he followed in the righteous way of someone who loves the Lord. In verse 4, it tells us one of his main exploits as king, as he separated from pagan idolatry that was destroying the nation and bringing forth the judgment of God upon his land. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. And if you remember, in the wilderness, Moses had lifted up a bronze serpent. But perhaps the people had become superstitious or idolatrous, even of this symbol of turning our gaze towards Yahweh, and now they had begun to idolize this item or this relic. For until these days, the children of Israel burned incense to it. So you see now that they're, they're idolizing this, this serpent, and now they've deified it, they've turned it into an idol. And they and called it Nabu ne, ne, Nehushtan. Nehushtan. He, Hezekiah, verse 5, it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord, was, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And so Hezekiah yoked himself to the Lord. He meditated on the law of Moses, as it were. He did not deviate to the left or to the right. He was careful to observe what was in the law. So he renewed his mind according to the word of God, and he applied it in his in his sovereign position as king, he made his nation an extension of the, the, the law of Moses, which was to have only one God and not to worship other gods. So you see, friends, when we collaborate with those who are not of the Christian faith in spiritual enterprise, we make an unholy alliance. We are unequally yoked in spiritual enterprise. The very thing God is against, we perpetrate when we when we become yoked equally with unbelievers. King Hezekiah showed us an example by tearing down the altars, by refusing false gods. And we'll look briefly at his reign in Second Chronicles chapter 29, 32. There's a lot here. And I think time will fail us to cover all of it. So we'll try to summarize it. But I encourage for those of you who have time to read the exploits of Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 to 32. But I want to just give a brief, maybe one heading. In chapter 30, it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah... And also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover of the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders all and all the assembly of Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem, and the matter pleased the king and all the assembly. So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Bethsaida to Dan, and they should come to keep the Passover of the Lord God of Israel of Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. So because of the unfaithful kings before him, King Ahaz, his father, there had been a falling away or an apostasy from the, 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 the Mosaic 
faith or the Judaism of that day, which was acceptable and pleasing to the eyes of God. And he, he made it a priority to reform, which means to go back to the, the origin, that which was proper, that that's which the Lord had revealed to the people through, through Moses, mainly the keeping of the Feast of Passover, which was a, a remembrance of the deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt, and now was being restored after hundreds of years of not having been observed. And it unified the nations as they all came in agreement to work to do this thing. And if you recall, in the caption that I read from, from chapter 30, it said the priests had not consecrated themselves. There were not enough priests who were dutifully mindful of what they ought to have done. They had not been prepared in the ways of Yahweh. They had not been following the decrees of the law of Moses. There was a shortage of willing priests who were capable of sacrificing the animals to have the Passover done in an efficient manner. And if you read further into it, it says that the Levites, they were more zealous and they assisted the priests in the sacrifice. So you see there's a distinction of some within the community of Israel who have been ready and seeking the obedience to the Lord, but others who have been not seeking the obedience of the Lord. They, they have, they have uh, fat hearts, hardened hearts. Um, they're, they're, they're lax to, to, to do their, their Israeli duty. But you have others who are zealous, fervent, and they're ready to, to take their, their hands and do the works that the Lord God has commanded. So this is a, an example if, of a, a good king who set forth this, this idea of consecrating his nation. Now we as the church, we have a responsibility to consecrate ourselves and be a, an influence of consecration on the, the, the body of Christ, which is the church. So we'll, we'll close now with the need for consecration in the church. So the last one from Hezekiah was an example of consecration. Now we will look at the need for consecration within the church. And that's going back to 2 Chronicles or 2 Corinthians where we began in chapter 11. Going back where we began in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in verses Two and three. By now, Apostle Paul has a lot of rapport with the Corinthian church. Remember, this is the second letter that he's written to them, and they were lengthy letters with a lot of content. And there's been a lot of controversy as to the credentials of the Apostle himself whether he was a, a real apostle or if they should follow false apostles who contradict Paul and try to demean him. But now Paul appeals not only to his apostleship, but he appeals on the basis that these Corinthians will have to give a, 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 an answer to the very Lord, the very God whom they believe in. That is namely the Lord Jesus Christ, which brings us to our concluding point the need for consecration. In verse 2 it says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband. To one husband. Paul is reminding the church that as baptized, born-again Christians, baptized by the Holy Spirit, we are yoked to Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the, the, the Lord of the church, but in the book of, of Ephesians, he's called the groom, and the church is called the bride. And if there was any picture of yoked, equally yoked in the Bible that, that, that the Holy Spirit is using for us to understand, it's this picture of marriage, this picture of oneness, this picture of unity. Paul is essentially saying, look, I'm jealous for you because you're yoked to Jesus Christ. He's your spiritual counterpart. This is the one to whom you, you've, you've, you've been 
born into. You've shared in his death, burial, and resurrection. You're one in Christ. We're told, for example, in the scriptures, if we make our body and take it to a prostitute, we've taken Christ's body and joined to a prostitute. Because Christ and us in, 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 in the church, we are one. Amen? He says, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, is concerned about the purity of the church. He's concerned about the consecration of the church. The reasons are numerous. But this particular reason is that Christ is the husband and we are the bride. So therefore, we must consecrate ourselves to be a pure bride. Verse 3 says, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Why? Because the temptation to follow other philosophies that are not the Word of God and the simple teaching of the New Testament are prevalent in our world. We have countless sources of information to entice us, to tempt us, to draw us away, counterfeits, antichrists, philosophies that wrangle for our affection, for our attention, for our, for our, for our agreement. So, so Paul is saying God is jealous. He's jealous for your holiness. He's jealous for your purity. But you can't associate with idols and the things of the world. You have to separate yourself. You have to consecrate yourself. You have to wash yourselves clean. Amen. Amen. So let us pray. Father, thank you for this practical guide to consecration. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you never give up on us. You sealed us, and you guaranteed that we'd be one day perfected. Along the way, Holy Spirit, you asked us to take these steps. You asked us to separate from unholy alliances, to being unequally yoked with idols. Father, this is, this is revolutionary teaching but it's biblical. We pray, Father, that you would help each one of us see in our own little lives, in our own little corners, if we've given any ground to the world and the philosophies that are not of you to have a foothold or a stronghold in our hearts, that like Hezekiah, we would, we would have those altars smashed. We would bring to, to light all corners and recesses of our heart to you, that we would fully expose ourselves that we would allow ourselves to be tested by you. And if there is any unwholesome way in our hearts, in our minds, in our speech, in our actions, that your, your truth would purify us. You would wash us clean, like in Psalm 51. You would cleanse us with hyssop. You would wash us clean. Lord, we do want desire to be a chaste virgin. When you return, we want to be a holy people. Lord, Give us grace to continue on in this walk, to partner with Holy Spirit, to be consecrated, set apart. Thank you, Father, for these simple instructions. Thank you for not abandoning us to a world that is not our own. For we long for a country that is built by a builder whose hands are not human and whose foundations were not laid by human hands. We long for, for the day when we will be amongst our God, and, and he will dwell with his people once again. Even so, come Lord Jesus, come. This we pray in his name. Amen. Sorry, Michael.